will now proceed with the conference and uh, with the second uh, keynote speaker uh, of the day, uh, uh, who is going to speak uh, about lifelong learning in the 21st century opportunities and challenges. And this, this is a great pleasure for me again to uh, to, uh, to introduce to you the second keynote speaker, who is uh, <laughs> Professor Dr. Mansa Fetzel, who is Vice Chancellor of Open University in Malaysia and a member of ASML Hub's Research Network for Development of ICT Skills, e-learning, and the culture of e-learning in lifelong learning. I will uh, say no more, but uh, give the floor to you. Uh, Professor Fatsil, please take the floor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, being a Muslim, I start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all. Uh, Professor Klaus Holm who is the chair of SM Lifelong Learning Hub. My fellow colleague, uh, Professor Jorgen Ostrom, one of the keynote speakers, keynote speaker number one. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a pleasure for me to be in your beautiful countries to share with you some talk on lifelong learning. I've been made to understand that there are more than uh, 120 of you from uh, at least 100 different countries. And I'm sure that you are here hoping to network. You are here hoping uh, to learn something. And in the first keynote by Professor Jorgen, we have learned quite a lot. A 72-year-old man who has got a lot of wise advices and wisdom for all of us. Thank you very much, bro. So this morning, I would like to share with you on uh, lifelong learning in the 21st century, opportunities and uh, challenges. But before I do that, let me start by saying that in life, in order to be successful, you need something called mental revolution. Professor Jorgen has described quite a lot of things with us just now, right? But as far as I'm concerned, there are perhaps five things that you need to know in order for you to be successful in life. Doesn't matter what is it, it could be lifelong learning, it could be your career, anything. The first one that you need is you must be passionate. P-A-T-I-E-N-Z. Whatever we do in life, sometimes we plan, but what actually happened could be different. And you must be passionate. You must anticipate all these changes. Secondly, in order to be successful in life, you need to think positively. Positive thinking can make or break your career. Right? So you have to be patient. You have to think positively. Thirdly, thirdly in order to be successful in life, you need to be meticulous. What I mean by meticulous is attention to detail. This is where a lot of people fail. Fail to pay attention to detail. We have to do that in life. Paying attention to detail. Number four, they used to say that make your passion your profession. In life, in order to be successful, you have to have passion. You have to be passionate in whatever you do. 
only until and unless you are passionate, you find it difficult. If you are passionate, whatever that comes your way is just a challenge that can be overcome. Uh, that is important, right? So you must be patient, you must have positive thinking, you must be meticulous, attention to detail, you must be passionate, and the last thing that you must do in order to be successful in life is to think, yes, we can do it. A classic example is the Nike uh, company. Their tagline is, just do it. Very simple tagline, everybody can understand. So for me, in order to be successful in life, you have to have this culture of, yes, we can do it. So I think these are the five basic things that you need to have in life. And I do hope that some of you can take this message back home. And I do wish you all the very best of luck in your career, whatever career you are in. So this is the kind of mental revolution that is important for each and every one of us. OK, let me now start with my presentation. Let's have a look at the recent trends in lifelong learning. Okay? There have been various focus areas, one of which is the technical and vocational education training, TVET. For us at Open University Malaysia, we only offer a pure academic program. There is no TVET. We leave it to, to our uh, colleges and, and so on. But I think in order to propagate the idea of being an entrepreneur and so on, we need to introduce program in TVET areas or TAFE, technical and further education areas. Because right, we keep giving entrepreneurship program to our student, but at a time they graduated, right? they are only good in academy. How can I be an entrepreneur if I don't have any good skill? If we can teach our student this TVET, then perhaps at the instant they graduated, they can be an employee, they or they can choose to be an employer. And being an employer is called a job creator. You can create job, you can expand the economy of the countries and so on. We do have this uh, in Malaysia at the university colleges, uh, colleges and so on, right? But I do believe even at university level, you should explore offering TVET program. Because uh, they are all kind of people, some of them are good academically, some of them are good in hands-on skill-based program. So we should offer them that kind of program. The other area which is very much related to lifelong learning is the ICT-led innovation, e-learning, uh, MOOCs kind of program. But lately, right? The idea of having MOOCs program is only for your lifelong learning kind of education, not for accreditation and so on. And I think we should be aware of that. And I would like to propose right, as many countries, as many universities as possible to offer their MOOC-based courses. Right? If you do it, do it well, it can have a positive impact on the well-being of the nation as well as the well-being of the country. Being an open distance learning uh, institution, we focus a lot of our effort on adult education, part-time studies. In fact, 99% of the students at Open University in Malaysia, I'm sure it's quite similar to other open universities in the world, they focus their effort on adult education, giving part-time studies. In this particular case, most of our students will be given learning material. They come at weekend, and they have an exam at certain centers also during weekend. And I do believe that as far as lifelong learning is concerned, adult education and part-time studies can play a big role 
in making the state of economy for the country right, much better than what it is. And lifelong learning, you need to continuously educate yourself. And what better way than through adult education or part-time studies? The only thing that is uh, bothering me a little bit is that a lot of open and distant learning universities, we focus more on academic related program. Very little is devoted to TVET or TAFE program. I, I believe that in the long term, we should offer academic based program as well as TVET kind of program, 50, 50, 20, 80, or 30, 70, doesn't matter, as long as we provide an opportunity for the working out there, working adult out there, right, to further their studies in areas that they are passionate in. In terms of uh, uh, delivery, we offer all our program either through online or through flexible mode, right? Certain subject, purely online courses, certain subject with high failure rate, difficult to be understood kind of subject, we offer through blended mode of learning. And just to digress a little bit, in July last year, I attended INSEAD, the Advanced Management Program for one month at Fontainebleau, France. Right? And one thing I couldn't help observing there is that there are various mode of learning. You learn by attending lectures, you learn by doing management game, you learn through discussion with your peers and so on, right? And I think in order to make lifelong learning interesting, engaging, and useful to the staff or to the potential uh, students out there, we need to offer many modes of learning, right? Some people learn through pure lectures. Some people learn through management game. Some people learn through discussion. Right? So the more modes, the better. And I think at the moment, a lot of universities are focusing their mode of teaching only through lectures. What makes you think that lectures is the only way in which you can deliver your program? Right? Perhaps you have to intersperse with management game. You have to intersperse with orchestra. You have to intersperse with a discussion because that will make learning even more effective, even more engaging, and hopefully, right, your attrition rate will be much, much less compared to the normal, traditional, open distance learning education. Let's look a little bit on the 21st century skill, right? First, we want them to acquire knowledge, but then apply those knowledge in life. Not just acquiring knowledge for the sake of acquiring knowledge, right? Application of knowledge is important. Next, we're looking at cross-disciplinary skill. Nowadays, right, people don't study in just one area, normally two, three different areas. And I have attended a talk recently, right? One of the complaints by our Director General of Ministry of Higher Education is the soft skill or the communication skill. So whatever we do, right, we make sure that our student has got good communication skill. The ability to get your ideas across, the ability to write your ideas in nice, form a good, uh, what we call communication, and we want them to be able to communicate and convince the decision maker in whatever they do, right? So that is important. And of course, talking about technology and so on, right? Everyone ought to be ICT proficient and they must be aware what is happening in the world, right? Because nowadays, when you get education, you don't think about working in the country. You're thinking about working outside the country, cross-border kind of uh, employment. And 
we as the provider of education, provider of a lifelong learning, we must make sure that the education that we impart upon our students are relevant, useful, and universally applicable. That's why I like the idea of having ASM. We meet together, we talk to each other, we network with each other, we try to understand each other's different culture. Because different countries, you've got different perspective in which you look at life. Right? So when we teach our students, right, we must prepare them for not just within the country, also outside the country. Because nowadays, the barriers are slowly being lowered and you can work anywhere as long as you have good command of English, you're able to convince your potential employer that you are a team player, you're innovative, creative. Normally, the people, they will hire you. Let's have a look at this uh, perspective. Commonwealth of Learning, UNESCO, and of course, other countries, right? For the Commonwealth of Learning, CO, if you are in the Commonwealth country, you know we have this uh, school based in Vancouver. All the Commonwealth states are contributing certain amount of money to Commonwealth. Uh, Malaysia, about a million ringgit. India, five million and so on, right? And uh, they focus a lot of their lifelong learning program for farmers. You wouldn't believe that there are a lot of farmers in this world, a lot of them. Right? And they need to be educated in order they, to make their program, their product, and so on more efficient. And they've been doing this lifelong learning thing in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, simply because there are a lot of Commonwealth countries there. And usually, they leverage on ICT to do this. Right? And now this, everybody is uh, leveraging on ICT. For UNESCO, uh, UNESCO is slightly different perspective. They are using lifelong learning to eradicate violence against women. That's it, the, way the gender thing is uh, very popular there in UNESCO. And uh, they have conducted the study in five Asian countries. Uh, they are talking about women empowerment and so on. Right? So different organization has got their own strength, has got their own focus and so on. Right? So for Commonwealth, more for the farmers and so on. For the UNESCO, gender biasness and so on. Right? And for other countries, you look at all kind of uh, other uh, perspective. Like in Malaysia or some other countries, we look at entrepreneurship for rural folk. We want to eradicate what we call discrimination, reduce uh, literacy, as well as uh, community development. As you can see, right? Lifelong learning encompasses learning from the day you were born until the day you expire. So all kind of uh, things are there, formal, informal, short, long term, short term, and so on, it's all there. It's up to the state, the countries to focus on. Within uh, Malaysia, in the context of Malaysia, we have 14. 14 ministry taking care of lifelong learning. Ministry of Higher Education, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Human Resource, and so on, right? If we think about it, maybe we need to create a special ministry, Ministry of Lifelong Learning. Perhaps their job is to coordinate all these many ministries we are trying to do lifelong learning for various categories of people. And one thing that is uh, different is that different countries got different ways or different stage of development. In Malaysia, we have recently uh, introduced something called Malaysian Board of Technologies. This is to encourage people with skill, skill-based to register with the board become a professional, and hopefully get a better salary in the process, better recognized by the public in the process. And in Denmark, I think the lifelong learning thing is very well developed. Uh, in fact, I wanted to see the TVET here in Denmark, right? But it speaks about the 
quality of education that we impart onto the people of the nation, right? But I do believe, if you ask me that, in order for the country to develop, in order for the country to be a better place, huh, every single one in the country need to have a good heart. You must be a good person. You want to help people to better themselves. If you cannot, then don't do anything. Right? But if you can, do something. We need to have that culture inculcated within us that we must be a good person, we must be willing to help the nation for the betterment of the people within the country. Let's move on. In the global context, right, uh, various countries succeed in their implementation of lifelong learning with varying degrees. Advanced system and framework like uh, South Korea Credit Bank, uh, that kind of system do encourage uh, lifelong learning. Right? And Denmark liberal education approach. That is important in the development of uh, lifelong learning. And uh, one thing you will notice is that countries like Denmark, uh, Germany, France, uh, education is free. But you have to pay quite a lot of income tax to do that. Eh? But in countries like Malaysia, Singapore, and so on, you have to pay for education. And it depends whether you are sending them to public universities, private universities, but you will have to pay. There is no such thing as free education. So it depends on how you look at life. It also depends on what are the priorities of each particular government. Eh? If they prioritize education, maybe they want to make education free. And so on. But if you ask me, education is a right. Everybody need to be given a chance to be educated. Like Denmark, up to university level, even it's all free. Huh? So by not having that one, perhaps we are preventing someone from getting an opportunity to better themselves. Huh? Maybe by having that kind of thing, everybody is given a chance to better themselves. So there are many ways in which uh, you look at it, you can look at it, but I think you need to charge a little bit, but maybe not too much. In terms of motivation for lifelong learning, right? Number one, we need to help them, we can complement them for their higher education. We can help them in the professional training and upgrading through lifelong learning developing the community through education, and also our opportunity. We have an opportunity to transform education approaches. Right? Lifelong learning is important. It's just that there are various stages, there are various approaches depending on the country, depending on the state of the country, and I think we all realize the importance of lifelong learning education. That's why we are all here today. I do hope that when you go home, right, you will propagate the usefulness of lifelong learning in transforming the nation to become a better place for everyone. Okay, in the Malaysian context, we have introduced a blueprint Enculturation of Lifelong Learning, 2011 to 2020. This particular blueprint was launched in November 2011. Perhaps for some countries which have yet to develop your own blueprint, maybe you want to do this, right? And uh, currently, various ministries are at various stages of implementation. Uh, as I said earlier, right, we have 14 ministries who are taking care of various forms of uh, lifelong learning implementation. And in the context of Malaysia, we have uh, primary, secondary, we have university, and we think lifelong learning as the third pillar in human capital development. This is important. Lifelong learning is important in our human capital development. We call it the third pillar. Primary, secondary, university, and lifelong learning. We plan 
to implement lifelong learning in a better coordinated way by putting in certain time frame and budget in our 10 and 11 Malaysia plan 2011 to 2020 because what you can talk you can discuss but you need some fun in order to make it happen and here at the government level the government is willing to set aside some fund to the various ministries to make sure that lifelong learning take place, will take place, and shall take place in the Malaysian context. Okay? So perhaps other countries have already done this. We are following certain countries, very advanced countries like Denmark and so on, right? In the Malaysian context, uh, lifelong learning, uh, we include this as one of our 10 shifts in the recent, uh, just now we have the enculturation of lifelong learning, right? but now we have the Malaysian Education Blueprint. Within the blueprint, we have 10 shifts, and one of those shifts has got something to do with lifelong learning. And there are four clusters within the lifelong learning activities. Number one, part-time academic program, including ODL. Number two, cluster number two is TVET, technical and skill-based courses. In the context of OEM, as I've said earlier, right, we are currently managing or uh, focusing our effort on academic-based program. Soon, we will be introducing the technical-based courses, which is cluster two. Short-term program is in cluster three, and we use our Institute Professional Development Unit to do this. And cluster four, full-time higher education academic program already in place, currently in place, but we need to perhaps face out some program, face in some program, depend on the needs of the people, depend on the needs of the nation. But whatever you do, we do, right? We must have quality and we must make sure that we can put the skill to good use once they graduated from your organization. The current scenario in the context of Malaysian government, we have various government-led initiatives and programs, including nationwide lifelong learning carnival. This is to promote the idea to create awareness within uh, the peoples, and hopefully they will join in one of our lifelong learning programs. At the moment, we are making use of a lot of our effort to increase awareness and to inculcate lifelong learning across the society within Malaysia. And uh, as you can see there, there are growing acknowledgement on the importance of adult education, I think not just in Malaysia, but in all the countries uh, throughout the world. And, uh, one very interesting areas that some countries already practice it, but some may have not done it, is this in area called accreditation of prior experiential learning. In the context of Open University Malaysia, 20% of our applicants are through this channel. So they have academic qualification, but slightly lower than what is required for entry, so they go through this Apple test so for them to be admitted. Nowadays, they can also use prior experiential learning for credit transfer. In other words, right, all those courses, short, short courses that you acquired through your experiential learning can be put to good use, either for entry or for credit transfer. Last week, the minister has uh, officially appointed our university as the national test center for Apple. Moving forward, right? you can see here accreditation structure. We've been talking about lifelong learning, lifelong learning. Right? In order for the people to move from one state to another, right? we need to develop the accreditation structure, international accreditation structure, credit award, and so on for lifelong learning participant. 
It, at the moment, uh, some countries have done this, some countries have not done this. But I think in order to facilitate the movement of lifelong learners throughout the world, uh, this is important. What are the opportunities and so on? Right? For the government, right? you can stimulate the economy and you can upgrade your labor force to make them more competent, more capable, and so on, through the provision of quality and lifelong learning program. For the education institution, we can diversify the program offered, not just pure academic, but also skill-based program. And we can hire people, increasing the expertise and resources available. For employers, ah, this is important. For employers and organizations, they have potential employee with the right skill and for individual right, getting additional qualification is good for you right so this is what lifelong learning can do to the government to the institution to the employers as well as to the individual provided we do it do it well we need to do it with quality commitment and dedication, because why? The welfare of the state, the welfare of the nation depend on having quality, qualified people. When we have quality, qualified people, then the economy will thrive, everything will be better for everyone. Okay, we are talking about uh, opportunities and so on. Let's have a look at what are the challenges, in particular in the context of the Malaysian uh, challenges, but some of it might be applicable to other countries as well. The first challenge is inadequate policies. Right? It is important for the country to have policies, to develop policies on lifelong learning. Right? For fairly advanced countries, very advanced countries, they have this. For those up and coming countries, you might not have this, but it is proper and only makes a lot of sense for us to develop these policies and make everybody aware and stick to that policies. Recognition and accreditation issues is of course a big uh, thing when you talk about lifelong learning. And the sooner we get this done, the better it will be for everyone, uh, in particular the non-formal courses and so on, right? professional training, they are not properly accredited. So maybe we need to develop a mechanism uh, to do this. And uh, the third one, in Malaysia we have this overlapping effort initiative leading to inefficient use of resources. We have 14 ministries all trying to do, trying to manage lifelong learning, perhaps one ministry that specialize only on lifelong learning and then they coordinate all the other ministries. Maybe we can get better result by doing that kind of thing. And uh, last but not least, right, for developing countries like Malaysia, public awareness is still lacking. Not pe many people are aware. As far as they are concerned, education means academic kind of program. They never think about TVET, TIF, skill-based program. And because of that, all the skill-based program, we imported from people from outside the country. You wouldn't believe it, that in Malaysia, we have close to 8 million foreigners doing this skill-based. Out of this 8 million, 3 to 4 million are unauthorized kind of immigrants. So, the welfare, the well-being of the country depend on lifelong learners. And the sooner we realize it, the better for the nation as a whole. And hopefully right, through attending this uh, seminar, through attending this conference, we become more aware. When we go back to our countries, we can promote awareness of lifelong learning to the people out there. The future of lifelong learning, we have to intensify our effort. And of course, one of the vehicles to 
what we call get this lifelong learning or ODL online is through ODL institution, e-learning kind of thing. Uh, we have to encourage lifelong learning as a solution to current issues. Example given a uh, graduate unemployment, they are not ready, they don't have the skill and so on. Right? And last but not least, we must have clear policies towards lifelong learning. The government need to come up with nice, good policy paper, right? And uh, hopefully through the policy paper, it is easier for the ministries and so on to implement lifelong learning in the context of a particular country. A bit about Open University. We are a university that is indirectly owned by the 11 public universities. We focus on open distance learning. Currently, pure academic program is being offered, about 50 or so program. But we would like to incorporate TVET and TIF program within the repertoire of program that we offer to the general public. And uh, we have a variety of learning material. But what is important, like Prof. Uh, Jeremy just mentioned just now, right, Prof. Jerome? The pedagogy. Pedagogy is important to ensure effective delivery of the program. OK, concluding remarks. So it is important that we have a continuous discussion, continuous sharing of ideas among ourselves so that we can learn from each other the do's, the don't. Some of the things that is applicable to Malaysia might not be applicable to you. Some of the kind of things that are not applicable to us, but applicable to you, and so on, right? And I hope you can take this important take-home message, and that is the importance of lifelong learning in our country in knowledge economy. It is important that everybody is well-educated, everybody is well-trained, so that the country as a whole will be a better place. And I'm sure Denmark as a country right, is a better place for us to stay. And we can see how great uh, Copenhagen is. And I hope you all will enjoy your stay here in Denmark. And I wish the best to Professor Klaus Holm. Right? And thank you very much, sir, for hosting this particular conference. Thank you, sir.